Hey there, I'm Andy Morrison with uh, Precision Fermentation. Um, I'm a sales engineer and I'm going to be talking today about uh, monitoring yeast vitality during fermentation and uh, um, how to um, better manage fermentation for um, better long-term health of yeast um, through reuse and uh, um, uh, uh, re-harvesting. So um, thank you to the uh, craft brewing professionals and, and our craft beer professionals group and uh, Andrew for putting this on and giving us a chance to kind of talk about this. Um, precision fermentation is, is kind of a collection of, of um, uh, beer nerds, data nerds, um, and, and fermentation scientists that have gotten together um, to create what we call a um, continuous fermentation monitoring method um, that allows uh, brewers to uh, look at um, fermentations uh, in real time um, across multiple metrics. And so I'm going to be talking about that today um, just as a, as a way to kind of give background to um, some of the conclusions that we've drawn or things that we've looked at. Um, that hopefully help folks uh, become better uh, yeast managers and, and thereby fermentation managers. So I will kick things off here um, by just kind of talking through what, uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So um, we know that there are, are um, issues uh, with, with current methods of fermentation management. Um, uh, and I'll talk about some of those, um, talk about what continuous fermentation monitoring is um, and how we track it and how our um, methodology for it gives us some key indicators for um, uh, looking at yeast vitality and fermentation vitality um, and what that means um, uh, for a, um, fermentation. Um, We'll look at some, some observational benchmarks that, uh, that we've been able to um, sort of build uh, and, and some of the trends that we've seen uh, over multiple fermentations. We've got thousands of fermentations tracked at this point with, uh, with data to be able to look at what's kind of roughly standard fermentation um, uh, progression and uh, what might be non-standard uh, or unusual fermentations. Uh, that we've noticed. Um, and then how this uh, methodology, uh, whether it's through a system like ours or, or in a different way, um, how doing this sort of continuous fermentation monitoring can help you with um, uh, that yeast management long term through some, you know, sort of short term adjustments uh, to your process. So I'll begin with kind of setting a baseline here. Um, you know, the, the big challenge in looking at managing um, uh, yeast and managing a fermentation process is, you know, when you enter into brewing, uh, you start brewing beer, uh, what you're really doing is managing a, uh, an industrial production um, process, right? This is, uh, sometimes we think about it like cooking in a kitchen or something. If you started as a home brewer, especially, you know, you're in your garage and you're kind of tinkering mad scientist wise, right, uh, with recipes. Um, but on a, on a business scale, it really is like an industrial um, uh, manufacturing process is really what you're doing. And it's reliant on um, this biological agent of yeast uh, that um, can be tricky and finicky and, and hard to manage or pin down, um, hard to get consistency from. So, um, what, what we want to do is give brewers the ability, um, and, and what we've looked at is how can we get insight into not just viability, whether that yeast is alive or dead as a measurement of, um, how well that yeast is going to do, but, um, but really vitality, how healthy is it, right? Um, you can have two people that are, uh, alive, um, and uh, one is in the best shape of their life and ready to run a marathon. And uh, the other has, uh, um, you know, been sitting on the couch for six months 
um, eating potato chips and watching TV um, and loses breath uh, just, you know, taking a walk around the neighborhood. So um, the yeast is the same way. And, and we want to be able to look into that um, in more detail to be able to show that. So you've got all these different stages um, uh, through the fermentation process, through propagating, through storage um, that can cause stress to yeast. Um, and if we can gain insight into what that stress looks like, but then also um, what's causing that stress um, in better ways, we can we can um, give better environments for the yeast and um, uh, that turns into better manufacturing outcomes. So the real challenges on a practical level for uh, this are um, things like uh, the type of equipment that you need, um, the, the type of personnel and the, the sort of repetitive nature of being able to take readings and look at uh, what's going on with your yeast. So, um, for example, uh, if you're reading um, yeast viability and looking at um, your uh, living versus dead cells and your total cell count of a slurry, right? You're using a hemocytometer maybe, and you've spent money on that. And you've had to train staff on the process of using that effectively. And even given all of the, those things, you know, saying that you've got a, a great hemocytometer and um, uh, you've got a person that's properly trained and is going through the step by step process of measuring um, cell density um, really effectively, even given all of those things, uh, you can still end up, you know, having inconsistent readings or inaccurate readings on yeast by viability, just based on the timing of when you're taking those readings, right? So um, if you take the readings right when you're running the, the yeast uh, into a brink, um, great, that's good for that moment in time. But if you're waiting three days and then emptying that brink out into a tank to start your uh, next fermentation, well, viability may have changed over that course of time, right? So timing matters, um, the instrumentation you're using matters, uh, the, the methods that you're using surrounding that instrumentation matters. Um, and all of those things can become hindrances to getting effective data um, beyond just a snapshot of what's happening at a single moment in time rather than the, the ongoing um, continuous health and, and uh, viability. Um, of yeast as you're managing it. So the results of that um, are that uh, you end up with this insufficient insight, right? You're looking at um, uh, um, like narrow, you're looking through a narrow keyhole to try and figure out what's going on with your yeast. Um, and especially once it's in a fermentation vessel, you're taking daily readings, maybe twice a day, um, and that's still only giving you these momentary glimpses of what's happening um, that are dependent on the, the relative accuracy of that single reading that you've taken. Um, and so if that one reading that you've taken is inaccurate, right, it can really drive things off the rails or give you a, um, a, a, an inadequate insight um, uh, into what's happening inside the tank. And so all that kind of stuff can lead to, you know, these, these um, scheduling uh, difficulties because fermentations aren't always finishing on a predictable timeline. Um, you know, the, the consistency of the product is impacted by seemingly unpredictable changes to yeast um, uh, and unpredictable just because you don't have that insight. Um, maintaining uh, those, uh, that consistency then um, becomes dependent on a more frequent purchase of say yeast um, and, and um, other ancillary products that are gonna keep fermentations um, running the way you want them to. Um, and, and, you know, the worst of all is the result when it, it turns into that, um, uh, that moment where you're looking at a tank, realizing that it's gone off the rails on you and you have to figure out um, whether or not this is something you can, um, uh, blend out over multiple tanks, uh, you know, multiple batches coming uh, subsequently, or do you have to dump it down the drain altogether? Or worse yet, take a subpar product and, and release it um, out uh, to, your, to your consumers. 
So what we've done, and this is uh, you know my my brief infomercial moment here. Um, what we've done, our, our system specifically, is what we call the brew monitor system. Um, it manages this real-time continuous fermentation monitoring um, that uh, um, does um, does the monitoring job of essentially yes, replacing your manual need for for sampling for walking over to a tank and pulling a sample, but it also de-emphasizes that that critical um, sort of need to get that. Um, uh, methodology and the accuracy, right? You know, you're not you're not pinned and 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 critically waiting to make sure that that the the single reading that you got in a 24 hour period is as accurate as it possibly can be, right? Um, because there's high repeatability with this system. It's just going to keep plugging away and keep collecting data. And so, so our system specifically has a physical device that attaches to a tank um, externally. It draws a sample every uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, uh, it uh, takes pushes that sample across seven different sensors. So we're reading um, gravity, dissolved oxygen, pH, pressure, temperature, uh, ambient temperature, and um, conductivity. Uh, and then you know loops does a continuous loop. So there's no product loss um, uh, in the course of that. Um, then what it's doing is it's taking that data, right? That's a lot of raw data to collect. And so what we want to do with that raw data is, is present it in a meaningful way to brewers. And so you'll see some of the graphics of what we do with that um, because the, the web application, the console is really what matters to us um, is how can we present that data in useful ways and how can you make sure that it's going to be something that's going to have a bottom line impact for your brewery. Um, and uh, so, so in taking these readings and in managing this stuff, there's a couple of key things that really give insight into yeast vitality. All of the readings we collect, I think, holistically go into looking at, at yeast health over time. Um, but the key ones that I'm going to look at are gravity, dissolved oxygen, uh, and pH um, today. And so I'll jump in and just kind of show you what some, some typical um fermentations might look like here so gravity obviously is is your primary indicator um, for for fermentation right um, we are all glued to this because this is what gives us an idea of how much alcohol is being produced um, which is the the key thing for ttb um, and and making sure that you're following within you know legal limits that you need to and, and presenting the product in a um, in a way that the government approves of, right? So, so gravity is a really key uh, metric, but it also reflects then, um, you know, what the yeast is capable of doing, right? How much sugar is it consuming and how healthy is it? You know, what's that rate look like? Um, so changes in the yeast over time can be reflective um, in uh, the shape of gravity curve. The next one, pH, um, uh, gives us some early indications of yeast crop health that I'll get into, but um, um, you know it's 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 also about um, you know the the flavor positive aspects of of what's going on, right? So the yeast is producing acid. Um, it's taking that acid, combining with the alcohol that it's also producing, and turning that stuff into esters, right? So super flavor positive. Um, you know when you smell a beer, something eighty to ninety percent of everything that you're getting out of that is coming from the yeast itself and the esters and phenols that the yeast is producing. Um, and so that ester production, you know, especially in ales is really critical to sort of get the strike the right balance. And of course that stuff has to do with how healthy is the yeast um, and how is it progressing through this fermentation. So monitoring pH gives us some insight into that acidity and that ester formation um, while also giving us some idea of, you know, how healthy again is this yeast and how is it doing um, compared to other uh, batches. And then finally, dissolved oxygen is, is the, the last key uh, metric that, uh, that I'll talk through today. Um, what we look at with dissolved oxygen specifically is, is all happening within a matter of mere hours. So um, typically dissolved oxygen is just, you know, based on that aeration um, uh, of wort on its way into the tank. Um, and uh, that aeration then um, is going to show up in um, 
this sort of diffused dissolved oxygen um, sensor technology uh, and the yeast is going to consume that um, and it's using that oxygen you know the best understanding of it is is that it's it's using it to help um, uh, keep the cell walls elastic enough so that budding can happen without excessive amounts of scarring. So essentially yeast growth, um, and pitch growth is, is, um, is going to be heavily influenced by dissolved oxygen and looking at those levels and the rate of change of those again, um, great insight into how healthy your yeast is. And so I'll show that here in a minute. Um, so here's where I'll talk about sort of typical performance. Um, what you're looking at on the screen here, this graph we're looking in green is uh, gravity uh, being displayed over time. Um, so the hour is kind of plugging along post pitch. Um, and if you're tracking in a continuous way, right, it's giving you this insight, not just in those single moments that you can see displayed there as well as the little diamonds um, mixed in. Uh, with the uh, single dots. So those are manual readings taken by a brewer um, and matched up against uh, the um, sensor technology that we have. Um, and the the readings that you can see, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious, right? Gravity moves downwards over time. You can even see a couple of knockouts happening um, within the first couple of hours there as gravity is kind of ticking upwards um, with subsequent batches of work going in. You can see the movements, that little bit of erratic movement there early on in pH. Um, but in spite of those things, what you're able to, to read past that and see is um, pH moving downward, right? So during the lag phase, um, pretty much as soon as that P as the yeast is in contact with um, fresh wort, it is going to start producing acid. Um, this is uh, part of an aerobic a process, right? Because there's still oxygen in the tank at that point, um, and an anaerobic process. Both of those parts are going to feature um, acid production by the yeast. And so you're going to see that pH drop. It's going to drop relatively rapidly, um, you know, during that lag phase. Uh, and then during fermentation as well, typically what we see is um, after. Uh, I think it's about 70% uh, percent after about two thirds of the way through fermentation um, is when we typically see pH start to inflect and rise back up again. Um, and that's telling us that the yeast is settling down. Um, potentially there's some, uh, some very standard um, autolysis happening, um, uh, you know, in a, at a minimal enough level to influence pH um, but not, you know, turn your beer into hot ham water or anything like that. Um, but as uh, that uh, pH rises back up, gravity approaches terminal. And so these are, uh, this is a very typical graph um, overlay here where we're looking at both um, gravity in green over time and pH in gray um, as those two things interplay against each other. For oxygen then, um, this is the same gravity graph there, and you can see how quickly that oxygen depletes out of um, uh, suspension. You can see the second knockout with um, uh, aeration as well. So, um, you know, dissolved oxygen is being depleted by the yeast. Um, that second knockout goes in, spikes the oxygen back up, and it continues dropping rapidly. The real key thing here is there's nothing that you're going to be looking at late in fermentation from a, a yeast health standpoint. So we typically keep the sensor in a PPM range. Um, we're looking in parts per million, which is plenty enough um, uh, resolution to be able to see um, how that uh, oxygen uptake is happening um, and whether it's, it's ma being managed at a healthy rate. Um, but really, this is typical. I mean, this is you know, this oxygen has pretty much fully depleted within about six hours here. Um, we've seen oxygen be completely um, taken up uh, by the yeast uh, inside of uh, an hour and a half um, on really uh, healthy batches of yeast and, and really vigorous fermentations later on. So, um, that spiking downwards can take a range though, you know, loggers are obviously going to take longer. That's a slower metabolizing yeast. They're just slower to take up 
oxygen as well. Um, and so we see those things, we see um, you know, range from anywhere on the low end uh, of just over an hour, let's say for oxygen to, to deplete all the way out to maybe 24 hours. Um, but more typically what we see is, is somewhere between let's say three to eight to 10 hours um, uh, for oxygen to be completely scrubbed uh, out of the environment. Um, and typically then there's a little bit more time before that lag phase ends altogether and the yeast really turns and starts consuming. So there's a slight lag between oxygen depletion and, and, um, um, and the crab tree effect kicking in to, um, to drive anaerobic um, fermentation. So, so this is what typical fermentations look like. Um, pH and dissolved oxygen and gravity um, all together, right? Um, so now I'm going to take and, and show you, you know, by mapping um, and looking at similar graphs here, um, what does it look like to have atypical fermentations or substandard yeast health or um, other management things that you can potentially do? So, um, uh, so this is where we're going to look at evidence of um, poor yeast health. So one key is, is the stalled fermentation. That's kind of the easiest one to, to jump onto and cling onto first, right? So what you're looking at here is gravity over time for two batches where the initial batch of green there was actually the third generation um, of a high gravity yeast. Um, this was uh, being taken, a, a partner of ours was brewing up a, a winter warmer um, with a wee heavy um, Scottish ale yeast, high gravity Scottish ale yeast. Um, and so the third run with this same pitch of yeast, um, uh, the third time they used it was uh, what you can see in green. The fourth time they used it uh, was in gray. So they harvested off of the green batch, um, tossed it into a brink for uh, a day or two, um, and pulled it out again um, to, to run that batch in gray. And you can see the results are pretty clear there from uh, the... Um, uh, gray gravity uh, graph that's there that, you know, it wasn't until after about 60 hours that we started to see fermentation kick off um, and gravity move downwards. Um, so what does this mean? What does this show us about yeast health? Well, alone, um, you know, maybe you'd be looking at this and saying, you know, uh, you know, look, I could, I could tell this, you know, at 24 hours and at 48 hours, that bucket's not bubbling and stuff like that, right, um, to give you that indication. Um, but really where we can drive some value from real-time uh, information is by looking at pH and oxygen kind of combined here. So you can see across these two graphs that are here, pH similarly in that gray fermentation um, is flatlined there. And it flatlines for about the first 50 hours or so. Um, there's just no acidification, no movement downwards versus the healthy batch where pH obviously dropped pretty much as soon as um, the yeast uh, was in contact with the wort like we'd expect to see. So why did it take so long? Um, looking at the oxygen graph uh, starts to give us some insight. So you can see how on the healthy chart there, oxygen dropped rapidly from a very high point. On the gray graph, that oxygen just depleted a little bit more slowly and became more sort of asymptotic as it um, uh, approached uh, that low end there. Um, what was happening uh, was that that yeast essentially, um, while they had done some checks for uh, viability to make sure that they had living cells, um, this yeast had, had pretty much um, uh, become non-viable um, or unhealthy, uh, even if those cells were still alive. So you saw a minimal amount of oxygen depletion there happening pretty slowly, and then no acidification. So within those first few hours after pitching yeast, we had some really good indications there that this yeast was not healthy enough to actually drive fermentation. So what this brewery then did was um, grab a fresh pitch of yeast um, or work up a fresh pitch of yeast um, and pitch it in at 48 hours. So two days after the original pitch, um, they pitched fresh yeast in. They bubbled oxygen into the tank, and that's where you can see uh, 
um, the the movement um, there in um, uh, dissolved oxygen where it spikes upwards as they bubbled fresh oxygen into the tank. And the um, uh, that yeast then obviously looking at that same time frame here on pH um, kicked off pretty immediately. So that yeast started acidifying immediately, um, which if I jump back to this previous slide, then it was only a matter of a few hours later, a normal lag phase length of time, um, say about 10 to 12 hours before um, this uh, fermentation started kicking off again and gravity was moving downwards at that normal rate. So what does that mean? This means that uh, that, that with the um, this type of continuous fermentation monitoring um, and looking at this high frequency every 10 minute readings, um, what we're able to do then is turn that into actionable um, uh, um, actionable action, right? You can take your um, uh, data, you can look at these readings um, a couple of hours after pitching the yeast um, to see whether or not, uh, you know, this yeast is exhibiting healthy behavior um, in the form of, of healthy oxygen movement and healthy pH movement and be able to um, make adjustments as needed. So, uh, you know, gone potentially are the days where you know, brewers are walking into the cellar on the second day, um, you know, after the after brewing the previous day and just kind of listening for whether or not your, your airlocks are bubbling um, to know whether or not you've got a healthy fermentation on your hands. Now, um, this type of, uh, these types of readings can give you that indication that quickly. Um, so what are some other examples? I mean, that's just one, you know, key piece and I've got a couple more in here. Um, uh, that are really interesting to look at as far as yeast health and, and fermentation management. So I'm going to jump to those as well. So another example is how do you use oxygen and how are you dosing it in a meaningful way um, that's allowing your um, fermentations and your yeast to work um, in the best way possible from sort of a mechanical perspective, right? You're managing this um, uh, production process, um, manufacturing process, um, and again, giving the yeast that healthy environment uh, is key. So looking at this graph here, I'm overlaying, uh, you can see the light gray dots there um, are gravity readings um, and the, um, uh, the green trend line there is oxygen over time. And so these are overlaid. This is for a, a fermentation um, all taken within uh, the first um, 24 hours basically. Um, after pitching the yeast. So you can see gravity is already moving downward. Um, uh, so we've got a healthy fermentation. Um, this is this would just be a typical thing where, you know, you pitch and show up the next morning and, and there's your, your airlocks bubbling, right? But in the meantime, look at what's happened here. So what this brewer has actually done, you can see the movement sort of up and down here um, in gravity. And this is reflective of multiple batches heading into the tank. So this is actually a triple batch um, where the brewer aerated here, the spike that you can see in the movement downwards is the oxygen being depleted off of the initial knockout, um, aerating the initial knockout. The second knockout here um, at about hour three, you can see where it jumps the gravity up a little bit, um, but, uh, but there's no oxygen injected at that point. And then on this final knockout, um, they, they aerated again uh, while they were sending that fresh wort in. And what you see is the high spike. So it was a much higher gravity um, on that final knockout. If they were trying to target a slightly higher gravity on the initial knockout, they you know, compensated for it um, by, by sending in some higher gravity wort on this final one. And you can see how it just kind of hovers here. And that's, you're looking at about a four or five hour lag there. Um, so what's happening inside the tank at that point is actually stratification, right? So we're looking at um, uh, the, the, the wort, the fresh wort coming in, just sitting at the bottom of the tank, not mixing effectively in with the wort that's already been in tank. And it's not mixing for again, that like four to five hour um, time frame there. Um, and so while that's, uh, while that's happening then, um, 
uh, you know, we might look at causes. Why might that be the case? Well, by noticing here that the that oxygen spiked upwards and that you aerated at that point, but that um, the oxygen had been depleted within uh, the first hour after pitching yeast, really right here, you can see within hour, one hour, that oxygen's down to about the threshold of the sensor um, and, uh, and depleted effectively. So this yeast, um, what, what we would guess at this point is that this yeast um, had undergone crab tree and switched to anaerobic fermentation. And it actually started consuming sugar, um, even though there might not be a, a, a surplus of evidence of that here. You can see it ticks downwards, but maybe that by itself doesn't tell you that um, fermentation has actually kicked off. But as soon as you drive oxygen into that tank, well, then the stratification is happening because, of course, the yeast then um, is turning its attention back to um, uh, taking up that oxygen uh, and um, has switched back to aerobic fermentation and growth rather than um, the anaerobic fermentation and sugar consumption that we want to drive. So you've done two things. You've, you've potentially kind of overgrown the fermentation from what you were looking for, um, but then you're also potentially looking at um, uh, um, lagging your beer further behind, even just by a few hours, um, lagging that beer further behind um, and extending that lag phase just because um, you sent oxygen in at a, at a less than optimal timeline. So some really good information here to kind of glean off of a graph like this to be able to um, drive uh, um, changes to your process and your standard operating procedure um, for how you manage um, aeration of wort and, um, um, and how that's influencing yeast health. Another key example uh, that we have from, from looking through data um, is uh, looking at the sensory discrepancies and, and like I was mentioning previously, how pH can kind of show performance um, and um, ester formation. So what you're looking at here is three batches, um, all of the exact same beer being produced um, in series uh, with itself. And the batch, uh, the, the black graph kind of overlaying the other two, you can see um, after about hour 40 uh, is when we start to see discrepancies, like a, a real true discrepancy between that graph and the others. Um, and so this is telling us something about the yeast health. This is like suboptimal. Um, and in fact, um, the brewery that, uh, that brewed these three batches um, noticed not because of the pH difference, um, but notice because in their sensory panel, um, they did catch some acetone being formed um, and it had slight hints of nail polish remover. Um, so that of course made sense when we map that against this pH because you're looking at acid formation um, that's gonna build towards the high esters and the acetone and stuff like that that's gonna come through, right? Um, and so being able to kind of map that and look at um, uh, those sensory qualities being displayed out here as an indication of yeast health, again, you know, just speaks to um, the power of having this type of continuous monitoring um, and, and high frequency sampling um, going on. So to, to pull back here from specific examples and kind of think about things um, in, in, a, in a larger scale, what does this mean for your brewery? What's the point of all of this, right? Um, well, every beer is different, um, every brewery is different, every brew house is different, um, the ingredients that you uniquely use um, to, uh, to, to brew different beers that you make, all of that stuff is going to um, have an impact on what these graphs look like, right? So um, what's important to do is to um, build a baseline based off of your unique recipes um, and, uh, and then to be able to um, uh, have that model uh, in place. And so it takes monitoring or looking at multiple fermentations, um, but, but not as many as you might need um, if you're looking at daily samples. So, you know, imagining um, uh, taking, you know, samples, uh, taking your readings that you've taken in an Excel spreadsheet and just looking at the once a day um, 
you know, any discrepancies again in that, uh, um, uh, in your team and how they're managing that sampling process, um, any discrepancies in the instrumentation that you're using. I mean, there's a lot of issues with reproducibility of measurements uh, when you're talking about um, um, the, the sort of standard process um, for uh, tracking fermentations. Um, and what we have is not only high reproducibility, but high repeatability in measurements. So being able to rapid fire measurements and look at those repeatedly um, over these data sets starts to give you this idea of how much um, uh, information you can glean and how quickly you can build models on this stuff. Um, and so from there then, you know, being able to take multiple batches and build that into an aggregate benchmark um, you know, is kind of key. So what we do is use this idea of continuous fermentation monitoring um, to, um, uh, to look at the shape of the data um, and, and less on what a single data point is and where it's at at a single moment in time. It's about like, what's this continuous flow look like um, of data? Um, and because we have so much of it, right, we can minimize statistical um, error measurements, right? We've got small, low standard deviations in measurement, which means, um, which means really good modeling and means precision is coming from that abundance of data, um, not from uh, um, the, like this intense um, need for accuracy on any sort of individual reading. So, um, so, what we see being really beneficial again here is, is building this benchmark, putting it in place, um, and then being able to look at variations against that benchmark, right? So thinking back to um, the, the stalled fermentation, right? If you've built a benchmark for yourself based on um, pH and gravity and, and dissolved oxygen, those things now can become dynamic um, early indicators um, of that uh, health of your yeast over time by combining um, those three things together and looking at them uh, more holistically. And so what we see is um, optimized processes coming from that. So um, can you use those benchmarks? Can you use that modeling then um, to, uh, to signal yourself when um, you've got poor health of the yeast um, when you've got potential contaminant in there. Um, and all of those things are going to cause unusual movement across these variables um, that are going to be alertable. Um, and so that's what, uh, that's what we like to do with the data is, is build alerts in both these sort of um, ranged alerts or these dynamic alerts based on unusual movement away from this norm or this benchmark that's been set um, but then also looking at threshold alerts um, and um, those, you know, building in thresholds and, and um, looking at that stuff allows you um, to, to narrow down optimal windows for things like um, not just uh, uh, yeast harvesting and stuff, but also um, dry hopping, cold crashing, spunding, any of those things which can also have um, ancillary effects on the health of the yeast, right? If you're applying too much pressure to yeast over time, um, then you're uh, you're limiting the health um, and limiting the long-term use of that yeast that you could get out of it. So how many generations of yeast um, can you turn out of a single slurry? Um, that's going to be dependent on um, how well you treat it and how well you treat it is dependent on what these variables look like, right? If this is, if these are the indicators of yeast health, um, then this is what we should be looking at uh, over time to really make sure that we are treating the yeast the best we possibly can. Um, and so to kind of summarize all this stuff up, um, uh, we think that there's some real benefits to um, uh, to, to this sort of uh, uh, monitoring of vitality um, that gives you um, all of these things, right? Uh, um, better understanding uh, of what your yeast health looks like and how it displays out, given your unique yeast strains that you're using, the unique recipes, the unique tank sizes and shapes and configurations. Um, uh, once you've got that uh, insight kind of established and it, it, it helps with... Um, um, better repeatability over time, right? Um, you're you're uh, 
you're leaning on um, improved benchmarking capability and tighter control over the process just because you've got that greater insight, um, which then helps you obviously drive towards um, more efficient process. So can you get more turns um, and, and more use out of a single pitch of yeast just by treating it better and optimizing the timing of when you harvest it um, and, and when you feed it oxygen and all of those things during the fermentation process. And so we see all of that as a net win and all of it's built on, you know, this idea of accuracy that stems from um, high frequency data and an abundance of that data um, that, uh, um, that lets you step away from having to stress about, you know, what's the specific instrumentation, what, you know, what's the best um, uh, gravity benchtop uh, sensor that you're using, what's the best pH handheld probe that you have to calibrate every single time you use it, right? We can get you guys away from that kind of stuff and, and help um, uh, brewers do that. We want to be able to. And so um, we think whether it's through our system or or through um, uh, anything else that's providing, providing this type of continuous insight into fermentation, that there's a lot of um, uh, value to be gained, a lot of ROI out of systems or out of um, modeling like this. And so with that, uh, I'll close it off and see if there are any questions. Um, you can, uh, you know, also uh, ping questions to us uh, by by emailing out to info uh, at precisionfermentation.com, or you can check out our website. We've got lots of blog uh, resources um, and are looking at a lot of um, uh, new and, and interesting details about um, fermentation management um, as we go. So any questions? Cool. Well, one common question that I know that uh, that we typically have, um, while well, I wait to see if anybody else kind of tunes in with uh, with anything, um, one of the common ones is 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 how many fermentations um, we'll we'll get asked how many fermentations would I need to um, sort of build uh, or track in order to be able to build an effective model um, for this, um, and. Uh, it, it, it varies um, depending on how consistent you're, you're, you are um, at, at brewing and, and creating the, the appropriate extract levels and managing the yeast. But um, typically what we see is, you know, beginning about three fermentations of the same beer, um, you can start building a model and have enough information to start putting some static alerts in place. Um, and then after about a half a dozen or so is when it really starts to kind of um, dial in and zero in on consistency and, and um, uh, being able to really optimize things. So we see that that range of three to six fermentations, which, you know, considering that you're looking at every like two weeks, you know, six fermentations, you're about three months in um, uh, to, uh, to managing uh, and, and working with a continuous fermentation monitoring system before you're really going to start being able to, to drive some, um, some true benefits um, or some stronger benefits out of this. Um, so at least from a yeast vitality standpoint. Um, we have another question. How far away are you from having a smaller monitoring unit to attach to fermenters? That's a great question. The, the goal of, of, of any technology, right, is to is to shrink. Um, so we are actually uh, development team tells me that we're uh, within the next like two months away from having um, a slightly modified uh, version. I think the enclosure itself, we've got a the box that attaches to the tank is about the size of a large shoe box, maybe a pair of boots in there or something. Um, it's going to shrink slightly, but mostly stay the same footprint. What we are doing with it is um, we've figured out a way or they're working on finalizing a way of streamlining it and, and sort of hugging it closer to the tank um, and shrinking the, the tank connection piece that replaces a Zwickle on a tank um, through standard PC port or that's more adaptable to other port configurations, DIN fittings um, and the like. So.
Um, so, so we're, we're, when they tell you we're within a couple of months, you know, that tells me that it might be right after the start of the new year, um, just to kind of hedge bets. Uh, uh, and then from there, we are going to be working on, you know, the next generation of that model will hopefully um, shrink altogether um, and, and become smaller. But, uh, you know, with seven different sensors inside the box, it can be hard to kind of like combine that down. Um, and make it uh, a whole lot smaller than it is, but we are constantly working on that. Good question, thank you. Cool, well, thanks to everybody and, and anybody that's kind of tuning in to, to look at what we're talking about here. Hopefully uh, we've provided some helpful information. Um, and if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to, uh, um, to reach out. We love talking with folks about fermentation. Like I said, we're a bunch of, of brewing nerds and and data nerds and and uh, um, you know microbiologists all kind of spun together. So um, we love having these types of conversations and and digging through data on this stuff. So um, so feel free to reach out. Thanks again.